Okay, welcome back after break. Um, just before we went for our break, we were um, uh, studying Galatians uh, and uh, about the law and what uh, the world states there. Uh, so we see that the real problem is not the law or the sin that is ruling, dominating in our flesh or members of our body. Okay, and we also uh, before we went for our break, we saw that the law is good, spiritual, just, holy, right, but the law was not sufficient in itself to aid us, help us to keep the law. Okay, and, and also the law made sin more noticeable and you know condemned us. Uh, you know, what about curse? But look at what uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. Can somebody read that? Galatians 4, 3. Okay. Uh, continue. Galatians 4, 3. Uh, can, can, can you give him the mic, please? It's not what you're reading, it's not the reason. Yes, so here what it says that we were in bondage under the elements of the world. What is the elements of the world? Here it's referring to philosophies, ideologies, and rituals. Okay, so he's telling the Jews that you are under bondage of the elements of this world, means rituals, traditions, philosophies, you know, all of these things. And also we read in, uh, in you know, in the background of the, the churches, in the early church, you know, they were bringing in many of these traditions, Jewish traditions, mythologies, some genealogies they would bring of their forefathers, and they would tell people they have to, you know, follow those traditions and all of those things, you know, just confuse the minds of the uh, uh, Gentile believers. So he says that being under the law was being like bondage or as being as slave. Now you need to know that the law is not burdensome. The law is not making us, um, you know, it's not burdening us. How do we know that? If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11 to 14, it says, for this command, which I command you today, is not too hard for you or too distinct. So God is telling these commands which I've given you is not too hard for you. It's not too distinct. Okay, that means it's not too difficult for you to keep. It's not a burden for you. Look at what 1 John chapter 5, verse 23 says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 22 and 3, sorry. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Can somebody read that? 1 John 5, 2 and 3. Bible. Bible is people that we love the children of God, when we love God, we keep his commandments. Continue. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So his commandments are not burdensome. James 1.25 says, but he who looks in the perfect law of freedom. So the law is basically not burdensome and the law is perfect and the law gives us what? Liberty and freedom. James 1.25. Okay, the law gives us freedom. So when God sent his son, you know, uh, he sent him under the law okay, to free those who were in the law. Why did God come to, why did God become man to free us from the law? Because we are, we were held bondage to the law. That means we were held, we are bound to the rituals, to the traditions. We were just doing it out of no love, out of no reverence to God himself. It had no significance, it had no meaning, all of those rituals, those traditions. That is why the, even the people, when they sin, they know they broke the law, they would take some kind of animal and go and sacrifice it. They would not see if it was an 
unblemished animal. It was without blame, spot, healthy, just something. And you know what God says in Haggai and Malachi? Go and offer these kind of animals to the governors. Will they take you? They won't take it. You know, then how can you come and offer it to me? See? So even the rituals and the traditions, everything became very meaningless and it became very fruitless. And so he came to set us out of those bondage of looking at things in a very ritualistic way, in a very traditional uh, way. And he also came, Christ came to uh, redeem us from the curse of the law. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Why did um, the law bring curse upon us? Why did the law bring curse upon us? The law is good, the, whole, the law is just, the law is holy. It's perfect, it gives freedom. Then why does it bring curse? Because we could not keep the law. Remember I said, even if you break one law, it was like breaking all other laws. Just give me a minute, please. Okay. It's like breaking all other uh, laws. Okay. So that is what Jesus came to do. He came to remove us from that, you know, uh, the, the elements of this world, the rituals, the traditions, and also from the uh, condemnation of the law. The law condemned us. But uh, Romans chapter 8, what does it say? Whoever is in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, uh, so th there we see that when we are in Christ Jesus, we are not condemned, but the law condemns us because we can't keep the righteous requirements of the law, and so there's condemnation, and then there's also a curse that comes upon us. But now it's not that when we are in in Jesus that you know we don't have any laws; we can live in total. You know, liberty and freedom from any rules, any laws. No, all the Old Testament laws are still there. All of the Ten Commandments are still applicable, even as we are part of the New Covenant. But what does the law do now to us? The Holy Spirit enables us to keep the law. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength, the grace, the divine enablement, the divine empowerment, the divine favor, the divine grace to keep each and every law. Okay, so the law is not done away with, it's not abolished, even as we are new covenant believers, the law is still there, it's still applicable, okay, and law still serves its purpose, but we are able to keep it by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay, so it's so beautifully put uh, uh, for us in church, and we also see that Jesus came to remove us from the curse of the law, the condemnation of the law, and help us to keep the law to keep the rituals and tradition, traditions in a very meaningful uh, way. Okay, any questions so far? Any questions? Online students? Any questions you all have? In person students, any questions? Okay, nobody has any questions. Okay, there are no questions, then we'll move on. Uh, we look at the divine exchange that happened on the cross. Okay, uh, we've already seen in a greater length, in greater detail, uh, what happened uh, in incarnation, God becoming man. You know, uh, so here we'll see the whole purpose of the incarnation summed up in one verse, which is that verse, Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Okay, the whole of the incarnation sum, summed up in one verse that is 2 Corinthians 8 9. So, one can, can one of you please read that? For you know who betrays our Lord Jesus Christ, that though him of which it for you, since he become God, that you know his fault he might become Yes, so here we see that you know, for um, the whole of incarnation is just summed up in one verse and that is in um, you know second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 okay so uh you know here we see that christ became poor for our sake so that through his 
poverty, which means through his poverty means what? Through his incarnation, okay, we will become rich. How can we become rich? We can inherit the spiritual blessings. We can inherit everything that Christ has come to do for us. Okay, so here the first thing uh, that we can see is in the divine exchange. We look at the divine exchange. Okay, the first thing is Christ came to our level. He came down, he became like us, took upon our frailties, our weaknesses, so that he could lift us to his level at the right hand of God. Where are we all seated now? Spiritually, we are seated here in the classroom, but spiritually, where are you seated? At the right hand of uh, God. Somebody asked me, uh, I think it was Rin, you know, uh, what does it mean when you know, why did Jesus go and sit at the right hand of God? It basically means that when he sat at the right hand of God, it means that he conquered death, like we uh, read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, uh, where it says that after he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on um, high. Okay. So when, when Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father, it shows us that death could not hold him, okay, uh, and he has also conquered uh, death. Secondly, we also see that you know, him being seated at the right hand of God means that he has the highest place, because in the Bible, whenever it talks about the right hand, especially God's right hand, uh, it means, uh, you know, God's hand, right hand is the hand of strength, like we read in Exodus chapter 15, verse 16. It also, uh, the right hand also means it's a place of authority, like we read in Revelation chapter uh, 5, verse 1, where it says that I saw uh, in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven uh, seals. Uh, it also is a hand of strength because if you read Exodus chapter 15, verse 6, it says, Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. So God's right hand means it's hand of strength. It means the hand of authority. It also means um, uh, blessing. Uh, if you look at Genesis chapter 48, verse 14, it says, and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands. Because Manasseh was the firstborn, so the right hand should be placed on Manasseh, but he places his right hand on uh, Ephraim. So when we place a right hand on somebody, it actually means uh, blessing. So being seated at the right hand of God means that you know, God, Jesus basically shares God's strength, God's authority, and his blessing. And it's the highest place or the highest possible uh, place of honor or respect for uh, some, somebody. So when Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, it means that all other things and all other beings are under him, under his authority. Like we read in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 22, First Peter chapter 3, verse 22, where it says, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God uh, with the angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So, you know, when he sees the right hand of God, it means all other things and all beings are under his authority, under his subjection. And that is what right hand means, okay? That was Lynn's question, uh, and we were also looking at it in the divine exchange. And Christ came down, limited himself to our level so that he can take us to his level, which is at the right hand of God. So when we are seated in the right hand of God spiritually, it means we are in a place of strength, we are in the place of authority, we are in the place of blessing. Okay. The second divine exchange is Christ became what we were. So that we can become what he is. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Okay. The next divine exchange is Christ became our sin so that we can become his righteousness. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5 21. Christ was cursed on the cross so that we could be blessed with all spiritual blessings. 
he took upon our curses that we can be blessed. And on the cross, he took upon our sicknesses, uh, uh, you know, so that we can be healed. Through his stripes, we are healed. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he became the son of man so that we could become the children of God. Okay. Um, he, when he was born, he was subjected to the law so that he can redeem those under the curse of the bondage of the law. I explained that. You know, Christ came to the earth to tell us the Father, okay, or show us the Father, or reveal the Father to us. And now he is in heaven and he is telling the Father about us or he's interceding on behalf of us. In the incarnation, it was God coming down in human form to be with man. And in the resurrection, it is man being raised up to be with the Father. Okay. How do we know that? If you look at uh, Romans, I think it's Romans chapter, uh, um, you know, talks about in Romans chapter 6, I think. Um, or Romans chapter Yeah, when in chapter six or seven, when it says, you know, because of his uh, resurrection, we identify the whole law of identification. We have to identify, uh, sorry, uh, six verse five, when it talks about our identification in Christ, okay, that, uh, you know, what is our identification in Christ? You know, that. Christ died, we are also uh, dead too. He was crucified on the cross. He died, you know, we are also dead to sin. He was buried, which means our old life is done away with. Uh, he rose again, which means we are now a new creature. You know, he ascended to heaven, uh, which means now we are, you know, uh, we have the spiritual blessings and he sits the right hand of God. We are also seated with him. So we identify with him in his death. His burial, his resurrection, his uh, and his ascension, and his seated at the right hand of God. Okay, so we have that identification. So you can the reference there is Romans chapter six, verse um, five onwards. We read that. Then Christ was separated from the Father. Okay, um, so that we who are enemies of God can be reconciled back to God. So that we who are friends of God. Can become uh, sorry enemies of God can become friends with God. So this is a divine exchange that happened because of the incarnation. Okay, very important for these points. You can uh, look at it and read it. I'll just begin from uh, point one, where it says, you know, Christ came to our level to lift us up to His level uh, of the right hand of God. And I said that the right hand of God means. That you know, God was moved to a place of it, it talks about a place of strength, it talks about the place of blessing, and talks about a place of authority. Uh, that we looked at the uh, various scripture passages, you know, it's a place of authority, it's a place of strength, and it's a place of uh, blessing. Okay, so even as we are seated on the right hand of God the Father, it means that we are in a place of authority, strength, and Blessing that is what scripture talks about every time time it talks about the right hand of God, that is what it is indicating. So Jesus, you know, uh, came to our level so that we can come up to this level that is at the right hand of God. Christ became what we were so that we could become what he uh, is. Okay, one John chapter four. Uh, he became our sin so that we can become his righteousness. He on the cross. You know, took upon our curses so that we can receive the spiritual blessings. He took upon our sicknesses, our frailties, our infirmities, uh, so that we can be healed. He became man so that we could become the children of God. Uh, he came under the subjection of the law so that he can redeem all of us who are under condemnation, the curse of the bondage of the law. Okay, he came to tell us about the Father, reveal the Father to us. And he is now gone back to heaven, and now he is, you know, interceding on behalf of us, or telling the Father about us. 
okay? And the incarnation is God coming down to be with man, uh, but, you know, uh, in the resurrection, it is man being raised back with the Father. And how uh, does the resurrection, you know, uh, cause us to be raised back with the Father? Because in Paul, in, in his uh, epistle to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 6, verse 5 onwards, he talks about our identification. That just as Christ was dead, we too are dead to sin, the power of sin, the power of devil, the power of Satan, and death and sin. And just as Christ rose up from the dead, we also are, uh, we also have risen, which means we are a new creation. The old nature has no longer any authority and power, the dominion and power of sin has no longer any uh, authority and power over us. And just as Christ, um, you know, uh, went up to the heaven, he ascended to the heaven in the same way, you know, we have, you know, we have left behind the things of the past, our sinful nature, sinful deeds of the past, and now we are seated in the heavenly place, that means we're seated in a place of great authority, power, and strength, and blessing, okay? So the reference there is Romans chapter 6, verse Five. And Christ was separated from the fathers so that we are no longer enemies of God, but now we are reconciled back to God and we are friends of okay. So that is a divine exchange that happened um, uh, because of incarnation. And the one verse that, you know, fully um, uh, sums up the purpose of incarnation is Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Mm. Okay. Any questions on this chapter? Chapter 7, any questions? Yes, Lynn. We became God, God's enemies because we sinned. And we sinned, we became enemies of God. We're no longer friends with God. <clears throat> right? When we do something wrong to somebody and they don't like it, they've done it. They don't appreciate, they're not going to love us, right? They're going to be our enemies. Enemies with God means basically that our relationship with Him was severed, severed. We were separated from Him, right? We, we were far away from Him. Stopping. Because enemies don't see eye to eye, they are separate, they're far away, they have nothing to do with each other. Our sin made us enemies of God. What do we yeah, he's basically uh, he's interceding on behalf of us. So when we intercede, he is uh, he's interceding on behalf of us to the Father, and also he knows our temptations, our frailties, our weaknesses. So he's our advocate. He's on behalf of us. He's saying. Please forgive her father because I have paid for her sins. You know, have mercy upon her because of frailties or the weaknesses of the human uh, flesh. You know, so what we receive uh, out of the throne of grace is not the wrath of God, but it's because Jesus is our great high priest who's our advocate interceding or talking on behalf of us. So what comes out is not God's wrath, but grace and mercy for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? Okay. Any questions online students? Are all of you there in class? Because uh, none of you were responding. Sorry about the disconnect the call. Okay. There are no questions. We'll move on to uh, chapter eight. The virgin of conception. Okay, now in this chapter, we're going to be very briefly discuss about Christ's virgin conception. Um, so we look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, and Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. So one of you who's not read, somebody who's not read can read Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You can give it to them. Uh, and one of you can read Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. Give it. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. Mm -hmm. Slowly, John, please. Thank you. Okay, amen. Thank you, Sean. So here we see that you know there's there's much controversy uh, regarding uh, the Virginian conception of Christ. Virginian mean, conception means what? You know, a virgin. You know, uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, the conception in a in a in a virgin's womb, maybe is being formed. Okay. So many of them do not believe in the virgin conception. There are various theories why they don't adhere to these theories or to this theology or to this, this truth that is there in the Bible. Uh, they prefer rather saying uh, virgin birth, but not virgin conception. Okay, now these, these are two different things. Conception means it's when the baby is beginning to form in the womb of the virgin. Okay, that they have a problem, many of them have a problem to adhere to, to consider, to believe as a truth, but they are able to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, take on or accept virgin birth. But actually, if you see which was the supernatural work of God, it was the virginal conception or the virgin birth? Was it the conception or the birth? It was a conception. Because the birth happened in the normal process. Okay, it happened in the normal process, nine months. Okay, and then Mary gave birth to uh, baby Jesus. But the conception was supernatural. Why was it supernatural? Because it was to the power of the Holy Spirit. And it had, it was, there was no involvement of a male. Okay, and it was a virginal uh, conception. Okay, so if we look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Behold, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son. Now, uh, the, the Hebrew word for the word virgin is Alma, uh, which when translated can be young woman or virgin. So that is where the problem lies. Many of them are not giving into this virginal conception because they're saying, hey, the Hebrew word is Alma. It does can mean Young woman. Young woman can mean not necessarily a virgin, right? It can also mean somebody who's not a virgin, a young woman, okay, who's married. Uh, so it can mean young woman or virgin. So therefore, you know, different questions have been raised to the authenticity of a virginal uh, conception. But if you look at um, both Matthew and Luke in their Gospels, when they write about the virgin birth, and we just read. Uh, from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38, uh, the Greek word for virgin means parthenos, okay, parthenos, which only means virgin. Okay, it doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't mean young woman, doesn't mean a woman, it just means virgin, okay. So 
uh, many of them also adhere to the Virginian conception because you know they look at the Greek uh, literal translation and it, it means virgin, it does not mean anything else. Okay, so we know that Virginian conception is something supernatural, it defies all scientific uh, laws, it violates every natural law because no virgin can, you know, conceive okay uh, on their own. Uh, so it is violating all natural laws and everything that is scientific. Uh, but you know, we see that it is supernatural and God can do the impossible. When God can cause man to come out of dust, when God can, you know, just speak and things can come into existence and there can be perfection and order and uh, everything perfect, you know, there is nothing that he cannot do. And so this miraculous conception in Mary's womb was a virgin is not impossible with um, God, okay? So we look at the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth, uh, which we can see at least in two areas, you know, um, why was virginal conception very, very important, okay? We're not looking at virgin birth, we're looking at why was virginal conception very, very um, important. The first thing that is important is because of the Edenic covenant that God made, Genesis 3 verse, to feed, or does it say, the seed of the woman will ultimately destroy the, or crush the head of the serpent. So we see that, you know, Jesus, God becoming man, and, you know, he was born as a human being, so the seed of a woman, and he was able to overcome the power of, or destroy, or nullify, or undo the works of Satan and disarm him uh, on the cross. So it's not something that can be done by human effort. It's only the mere uh, uh, plan, the will, and the power of God. So it's God's own power to brought about the fulfillment of this uh, prophecy. So the virgin conception and the virgin birth of Christ is a reminder to us that salvation can never come through human effort. It's only the work of God. It's God's effort, it's God's plan, it's only God who can um, bring about. So our salvation, okay, it, uh, is only through supernatural work of God, and that is very evident from the very beginning of Jesus's um, life, like we read in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. So why not you can please read Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, please. Yes, so God sent forth his son born of a woman. Okay, so here we see that and he came to redeem us from the law so that we can become his sons and daughters. So it is the work of God, it's not the work of man. And we see this at the very beginning of Jesus' life. The second thing is the virginal conception or the virginal birth made it possible for humanity and deity to coexist in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so and now we can think of other possible ways that God could have sent Jesus Christ from the earth. What are the other possible ways that God could have sent Jesus Christ on the earth? How? Oh, what, what do you think are the other possibilities? Okay, God could have created uh, his son in a human way, fully human, and just dropped him down on the earth. Okay, now if he had done that uh, without any human parents, without being born on this earth, uh, would incarnation uh, in the fullest sense be meaningful to us? No, why? Why? From all that we have studied, the last class and 
today in the first hour why can you use the mic please so that others can hear yeah others speak okay only those uh, man who are under the law can redeem us from the law okay Yes, Sean, quickly pass it on, yes. Yes, it could be difficult for us to identify how God can understand our weaknesses, how can he understand my frailties, how he can understand what I'm going through, you know, when I'm feeling hungry, when I'm feeling weak, when I feel uh, tempted, uh, when I feel angry, when I feel, uh, you know, uh, when my friends give up on me, my family give up on me, uh, you know, when I feel lonely, when I feel depressed, how can this God identify with me? Because he just comes drop down from heaven. He does not, he will not experience, he will not understand what I'm going through. But the very fact that he was born as a normal process, as a human being, as a baby, grew up to be a child and to an adult and went through everything, we know, hey, this God who became man actually is fully man and can relate to me, can understand me, can understand my weaknesses and that is why he is there now at the right hand of the Father interceding on behalf of us. Why, how is he interceding on behalf of us? Anina and John has asked this question. It's because he understands our frailties. He understands our uh, weaknesses. He's praying on behalf of us. He's helping God. Um, uh, he knows our frailties. He knows our weaknesses. He's interceding or he's talking on behalf of God the Father for us. You know, please pardon Selina. Please be gracious. Or please be merciful. You know, this is her weakness. This is her, uh, her um, you know, this is her, uh, this is her weak area. This is an area where the sun, God, well, just give her strength. Give, aid her. Send her help. Send her angels. So he's like a, uh, he's like a priest who is atoning for our sins at the right hand of God. And also interceding means also, you know, speaking on behalf of us to the Father. If not, none of us would be here alive because we'd all be, you know, under the wrath of God. We would all be condemned. Uh, we would all be suffering. It's because of the grace and mercy of Jesus who is interceding on behalf of us that we can experience his grace, mercy, and uh, strength. So he will not be able to understand us. Now, what if, you know, uh, on the other hand, what is the other possibility that could have happened? On the other hand, what if Jesus, you know, was born into this world, he had both the father and mother, um, and then his divine nature was miraculously united in his, in his human nature at some point in his life. Then what do you think would have happened? He was born in a natural way to human parents, and somehow in between, somewhere in his, you know, when he was, 30 years old and he has to start his ministry, his divine nature, uh, you know, came about in his life. Then what would have happened? Take the mic, please. Okay. Okay. Yes, Sean. Okay. Yes, Sean. Yes, Sean. Yes, Sean. Yes, Sean. Yes, Sean. Yes, if he is born in, as a human being, two normal human parents, a new normal course that happens for any human being to be born, and then his divine nature somewhere, you know, uh, God decides to put it in, then we can say, hey, you know, how can he be like us in every way? How can he make that, he could not even make that full sufficient perfect sacrifice uh, as being that, you know, sacrificial lamb because he was born in sin. 
And because he was born in sin, how can he help us when we go to the temptation? How can we be, be our model? How we can, uh, you know, know that we can overcome our weaknesses and we can overcome our temptations. But it was possible, you know, uh, with this whole thing that God had planned, that from his very uh, conception that he was fully divine, he was fully human, it helps us to understand that, you know, God, uh, that even as God is fully human, you know, he understands our frailties, our weaknesses. He can talk on our behalf to God the Father. He can intercede on behalf of us to God the Father. He's our sympathizing high priest who understands our weaknesses, our frailties. You know, he can, um, uh, and he supports us, he aids us, he helps us. When we are tempted, he's there to give us a way of escape, to provide a way out, just like we read in uh, Hebrews, okay? So we see that, um, you know, uh, full humanity, full deity was evident from the very conception uh, in Mary's womb, and it was through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, okay? So that is why we say, uh, you know, virginal conception was something, uh, was the miraculous work of uh, God than the virgin before, okay? So, um, you know, um, I, this is still in controversy. Many people still do not uh, believe uh, this virginal conception. Many people even don't even believe virginal uh, birth. Uh, but, you know, uh, we need to believe it first because scripture affirms it. Scripture says it. We read it in Luke chapter 1. We read it in Isaiah chapter 7. Okay. And uh, certainly such a miracle is not typical for God who created the entire universe, who sustains it, who holds it with the power of his word. Then he can sustain the entire universe when he can create a uh, perfection, order, beauty from nothing. You know, this is not impossible. Uh, it is just confessing, you know, um, uh, with our mouths what he has done and believing in our hearts that anything is possible with um, God, okay? Uh, and then the last thing is, you know, um, in addition to the fact that scripture teaches us about the word in her, you know, it is important that this doctrine is understood as a biblical teaching um, and that it is accurate, that it is correct. And, uh, you know, we need to begin to perform this doctrine. We need to believe this doctrine, believe it's the truth and also preach it. Okay. So chapter eight is a very short chapter, a virginal conception. Any questions? Nina, did I answer your question about uh, when we say Jesus intercedes for us, what does it mean? Did that help answer your question? No. One minute. Okay, we'll wait for Nina John to answer. Uh, in the, yes, who are you, Alan? Sorry? The Eden covenant, yes. Okay, so the Eden covenant in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says what? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the so the seed means what the offspring okay or the the, the the child of the woman will crush the head of the serpent how it narrates to the virgin conception because it says there that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent so jesus had to be born of a woman Okay, he had to be born to a woman. That is the first thing. To fulfill the Edenic prophecy, the covenant, he had to be born the seed of the woman. That means the child of the woman. Okay, the offspring of the woman. So he had to be born of the woman. So he cannot be just dropped down from heaven as a human being in full human form. Okay, or as a child, he cannot be dropped down from heaven. The seed of the woman, that means somebody from our own race is going to crush the head of the serpent is going to end this slavery it's going to end this the the power and dominion of a state okay so and and because he did that he becomes our captain he shares our victory we share that victory and we can overcome the power of 
uh, sin. Okay, and also the seed of the woman uh, will crush the head of the serpent. Is that if Jesus came down as God, then it's not fulfilling that prophecy because he's come down as God and he's crushing down the devil, and it's it's not fulfilling the Edenic covenant. So, and also that Jesus, uh, uh, you know, the seed of the woman also means that. You know, it he has to be born to a virgin because if he's born to human parents, then there's involvement of sin and he cannot die on the cross. Okay, so in those yeah. terms, yes. Okay. Uh, one minute. It's uh, is the audio not very clear? Online students, audio is not very clear. Oh. They're saying that there is, uh, sorry about the echo. I don't know why there is an echo, but I kept the mic far away. Um, so sorry about that. Okay, but the, all the students are saying that it is echoing for them. Okay, sorry, maybe this is an important class of uh, Zoom. You can listen to. Uh, you know, uh, the lecture which will be posted on the stream page. So sorry about that. We had so many important points. Okay, yes. Yes, so, so there are different names of God. In the Old Testament, we see different names of God. In the New Testament, also, we see, you know, Jesus is also referred to as Yaya, Alpha and Omega. You know, so Emmanuel is God with us. So basically, the prophecy of you know God coming down to man. Okay, so his name is Emmanuel, and also his also his name in Isaiah chapter six, wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. You know, all of those are names of God. So why don't we call him that? So we can call him all of those names, and also call him as a name Jesus. One and all. So. Yeah, he would be called Emmanuel. One of the names of Emmanuel is God with us. The prophecy is God is going to be with man. Yes, it's fulfillment of that prophecy. Okay, it's already um, uh, uh, you know past our time. But just talking about uh, just answering Nina's question. Nina, uh, you know what it means when Jesus is interceding on behalf of us. It basically means what we read in Hebrews. You know, it says that um, Hebrews chapter four, he's a great sympathizing uh, high priest who intercedes on behalf of us. You know, uh, he's talking to the Father about our when we go through weaknesses, frailties. Um, you know, when we need strength, when we need grace. Uh, he's standing interceding on behalf of the Father as an advocate, and also when we sin. He intercedes on behalf of us to the Father in the sense, you know, when we sin, the wrath of God just goes out on the throne of God because God's nature is not changed. His wrath comes out when he sees our sin, but Jesus is there as an interceding high priest. He is interceding on behalf of us as an advocate, as a lawyer. He's saying, Father, I have paid for a sin, for his sin. Please forgive them. And what comes out is not the wrath of God, even though it's gone out on the throne of grace, but what comes out is forgiveness, mercy, and grace. So in that way, you know, Jesus is interceding on behalf of us to the Father. Did that help, Nina? Uh, very sorry about the, 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 the voice and the sound. Uh, you can listen to the lecture and maybe, uh, you know, there's so many important points. I said even about what it means to be seated at the right hand of God. Maybe I can just post it on the stream page so you can read that and the references uh, because we've run out of time. Okay, okay thank you everyone for uh, joining class. Uh, have a good day and a week ahead. God bless. Thank you everyone.
ಮಾಡಿಸ್ಬೇಕು